Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we're revisiting Intel's Outer Lake CPUs with a special sneak peek of an upcoming motherboard from MSI that's capable of making some of our favourite current generation processors much faster. For example, it's possible to make the Core i5-12400 up to 50% faster in games, and I'm going to show you how. But before we do... Today's video sponsor spot is brought to you by Team Group and their Evolving Invincibility Digital Expo, which gives you the chance to win some great T-Force products for gamers, such as a Vulcan DDR5 5200 32GB memory kit, Delta RGB DDR5 6400 32GB memory kit, or a Siren DG360 all-in-one ARGB CPU liquid cooler. To enter, simply fill out a short questionnaire and you're in with a chance to win some great prizes. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so one of my main issues with parts such as the Core i3-12100, the Core i5-12400, and the Core i7-12700 is that Intel locks them down, meaning there's no way to tinker with them to boost performance, commonly referred to as overclocking. Still, out-of-the-box performance is excellent, and if you're building a new PC, it's hard to ignore what these locked outer leg CPUs have to offer, and it would be extremely difficult if they were, say, in excess of 20% faster than first thought, or even exceeding 50% in some instances. Now, overclocking locked non-KSKU outer leg processors was first discovered by renowned overclocker DeBauer. Earlier this year, just a few months after the release of the Intel 12th Gen Core series, DeBauer managed to overclock a number of locked CPUs using the BCLK method, pushing them to frequencies well above what they normally operate at. For example, he pushed the Celeron G6900 from the default clock frequency of 3.4 GHz to 5.3 GHz, and that's a massive 56% frequency increase. This was an exciting discovery, and many of you asked me to investigate DeBauer's findings, but I never did because there was a catch, a rather significant catch that meant this discovery was ultimately pointless for the vast majority of users. Not to diminish DeBauer's findings, as they were accurate, and hats off to him for being the first one to discover this, but the issue boiled down to motherboard support. You see, DeBauer discovered that BCLK overclocking was possible on the ASUS ROG Maximus Z690 Apex, an almost $1,000 motherboard that requires DDR5 memory. So while a very cool discovery, it's not exactly a viable option for consumers. There are cheaper boards that do support BCLK overclocking, such as the ASUS ROG Strix B660-G Gaming Wi-Fi and B660-F Gaming Wi-Fi, but both require DDR5 memory and are still priced well over $200 US, so not ideal for pairing with a $165 US Core i5-12400F, for example. Now, the reason these LJ1700 boards can overclock locked CPUs is because they feature a PCIe 5.0 clock generator which is why the ROG Strix B660-G Gaming and B660F Gaming offer PCIe 5.0x16 support for the primary PCIe x16 slot, whereas almost all other B660 boards are limited to PCIe 4.0 support. So with the ASUS B660 boards both priced at $310 US, we've ignored locked 12th gen overclocking. That is, until now. News broke recently that MSI was working on a special BCLK OC version of their B660M Mortar, which would be called the MAG B660M Mortar Max Wi-Fi DDR4. And given the B660M Mortar is much cheaper than the ASUS models we just mentioned, like half the price, I was extremely interested. Therefore, I asked MSI if the rumours were true, and they told me at this point the information is strictly confidential, but also, yeah, it is something they're working on. So naturally, I requested they send me a sample, and to my surprise, they agreed and sent an early pre-production unit. So here we are. When compared to the original B660M mortar, this new Max model is the exact same board with the exception of the Renesas RC26008 external clock generator and a minor tweak to the VRM, which sees the auxiliary MOSFET upgraded from a 70 amp model to an 80 amp model. So, time to overclock, and the purpose of this content isn't to max out the locked CPUs that I have on hand, but rather show you that A, the BCLK function actually works, and B, the minimum level of performance you should be able to obtain. For this, I've overclocked the 12100, 12400, and 12700 to an all-core frequency of 5.1 GHz, with a ring frequency of 4.1 GHz. The P-core ratio was set to times 39 using the fixed mode, the non-K OEC microcode was enabled, the ring ratio was adjusted to times 31, and I went for a CPU base clock of 131 megahertz. 
Then for the memory, I'm using DDR4-3600CL14, which was set to a times 27 multiplier, and this resulted in a DRAM frequency of 3537 MHz, which isn't the real frequency as that's not how DDR memory works, but for simplistic sake, let's go with that. Finally, the load line calibration control was set to mode two, and the CPU core voltage mode was set to override mode with a core voltage of 1.37 volts. With some CPUs, you could probably wind this down to 1.2 to 1.3 volts without compromising stability, but I just wanted to make sure that all of my CPUs were stable for this testing. Again, I'm sure my overclock could be tuned for greater efficiency or higher frequencies depending on the silicon quality, but the goal was to find an overclock that should work for all chips. I have three Core i3-1200 chips on hand, one of which is an FSKU, and all of them worked. I also have two Core i5-12400 chips, both worked, and then a single 12700, which also worked. Now for the benchmarking, I'm again going to be using DDR4-3600CL14 memory, which has been set to DDR4-3537 using CL14 timings. For the cooler, we have the Corsair IQ H115i RGB Pro XT, and for the graphics card, we are using a GeForce RTX 3090 Ti. Okay, let's get into the data. Starting with a quick look at cache and memory bandwidth using ADA64, we find that this overclock isn't just about boosting the CPU's operating frequency, as you would with a simple clock multiplier overclock. Looking at the Core i5-12400, we find a massive 67% increase in L1 cache performance, up to a 74% increase in L2 cache performance, and up to a whopping 82% improvement for L3 cache performance. We also find significant improvements in cache and memory latency. L2 cache performance here has been boosted by 56%, and L3 cache performance by 76%. The DRAM latency is now also 76% faster, so massive improvements here for cache and memory performance via our overclock. Moving on to Cinebench R23, we find some great multi-core results, though this test isn't particularly memory sensitive, so we're mostly looking at clock frequency gains here. The 1200 overclock resulted in a 25% performance boost, while the 12400 became 18% faster. The 12700 overclock though, that was a lot less impressive, as that part is already clocked quite high out of the box. So just a 15% improvement here. But again, you could probably get some chips to run at higher all-core frequencies. Then we're looking at the single-core performance. We see a 19% uplift for the 12100, and then a 17% boost for the 12400, while the 12700 was improved by just a 6% margin. So again, it's the lower-end models that benefit the most from the overclock. The 7-zip file manager test also shows a 23% increase for the 12100's compression performance and a massive 32% increase for the 12400. The 12700 is again less impressive with just a 7% improvement. Then the decompression performance, it's much the same really. Again, a 23% uplift with the 12100, 28% for the 12400, and just a 7% increase for the 12700. The 12100 overclock reduced the blender render time by 19%, which meant the overclock was 24% faster. The overclock was 21% faster for the 12400 and just 14% faster for the 12700. So pretty typical margins here when compared to what was seen in Cinebench and 7-Zip. Now, because I didn't tune the voltages for our overclocks, the power efficiency is pretty terrible, almost doubling from what was seen stock. I did dial down the voltage with the 12400, but it wasn't stable with even 1.29 volt and this still saw system consumption hit 266 watts, so just an 11% reduction when compared to what's shown here at 1.39 volts, which is why I didn't bother fine tuning the voltages for this testing. Basically, power consumption increases massively because so too does the frequency, and in short, well, welcome to overclocking. The Factorio benchmark really only uses a single core and is heavily influenced by cache performance. The 12100 saw a 26% performance increase, then the 12400 a 27% increase, and then for the 12700 just a 6% increase. So once again, big performance gains are seen for the Core i3 and i5 models, which come clocked lower out of the box, but not so much for the more expensive Core i7. F1 2021 is another good example of why overclocking these locked Core i3 and i5 parts is so exciting. In the case of the 12100, we're looking at a massive 40% performance boost, while the 12400 enjoyed a 31% increase. Those are massive gains, and are certainly far more impressive than the 4% seen for the 12700. These results really expose how, for many of today's games, the difference between a part like the Core i3-12100 and Core i7-12700 isn't the core count, but rather the massive difference in clock speed, 
and of course the difference in L3 cash capacity. The Rift Broker is yet another example of this. Here the average frame rate of the 12100 was boosted by 45% while the 12400 saw a 34% increase. Meanwhile the 12700 dropped a few frames when manually overclocked resulting in a 2% performance decrease. What's crazy to see is that when both the 12700 and 12100 are running at 5.1 GHz, the Core i7 processor is just 4% faster. And I'd say the bulk of that margin can be attributed to the much larger L3 cache capacity of the 12700. The Core i3-12100 already performs really well in Horizon Zero Dawn, but with the overclock frame rates were boosted by a further 19% to 178 FPS, which is just 5% slower than that of the stock 12700. The 12400 also saw a 19% performance increase hitting 190 FPS, and now we're looking at Core i7 Lite performance. Next up we have Far Cry 6, and this is a lightly threaded game that relies heavily on single core performance. And this means overclocked the 12100, 12400 and 12700 all delivered very similar performance with just 5% separating the Core i3 and i7 models. We know that Shadow of the Tomb Raider likes cores and cache, so this time the 12100 can't quite catch the higher end CPUs, but still, a 28% performance bump is nice to see and it meant frame rates were well over 100 FPS at all times in our test. The 12400 also enjoyed a strong performance improvement via the overclock, boosting performance by 30%. But again we find another example where the 12700 was slightly slower, dropping just a few frames when overclocked. Cyberpunk 2077 performance was more limited with the 12100, and it appears as though clock frequency wasn't the primary bottleneck, as the overclock only improved performance by 11%. Meanwhile the 12400 saw a 20% uplift, though nothing was gained from the overclock with the 12700. Next we have Watch Dogs Legion, and this is another CPU demanding title. As you can see prior to overclock, the Core i3-12100 was only just able to keep 1% lows above 60fps, but when overclocked performance was boosted by 30%, resulting in 82fps for the 1% lows, and an average frame rate of 110fps. The 12400 also enjoyed similar performance gains, 1% lows were increased by 30%, while the average frame rate was boosted by 32%. But once again we find the 12700 gains very little from our overclock, we're looking at basically no performance improvement here. Then last up we have Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, and really all three CPUs had no issue with this older title. Still, if you're after more frames, our 12100 overclock did boost performance by 33%, and the 12400 overclock resulted in a 16% improvement. And the Core i7-12700 results are really unexpected, as we found only about a 15% improvement in productivity performance from our overclock. Then most of the games have shown little to no uplift, though admittedly many of them do appear to be GPU bound. Rainbow Six Siege though saw a 24% performance uplift, and I suspect this is largely due to the increased cache and memory bandwidth, as this game is very memory sensitive, so the results make sense. Well, those results certainly were very impressive, and I think the Core i5-12400 is going to be the sweet spot for this board, though the Core i7-12700 will also make sense. And I say this because the B660M mortar currently retails for $160 US, and MSI is expecting this new Max version to come in only a little bit above that, so I'm hoping around $170 US. However, there is a catch. MSI is aiming for an August release date, so about two months from now, which isn't that far away, but also by that point we are getting very close to next gen CPUs. So in short, the Mortar Max is an exciting product, but I fear it's going to arrive a bit too late for consumers. Still, if you happen to find yourself in need of a new PC around that time, the 12100, 12400 and 12700 are great options, and sticking one on the Mortar Max, assuming the board costs less than $200 US, would be a ripper of a deal. In comparison, the Ryzen 5 5600 on the MSI B550M mortar, which is a motherboard of comparative quality, that combo would set you back $300 US. Whereas I suspect the 12400F on the B660M mortar max, that'll be about $40 to $50 US more, so about a 15% price premium, which honestly, given the results we've seen here, I think is worth it. Granted though, I am yet to compare an overclocked 12400F with an overclocked 5600, but I expect the results will be a bit more favourable towards the Intel configuration. But again, the elephant in the room is the fact that you can buy the Ryzen 5 5600 combo right now, whereas the B660M Mortar Max is still a few months away. But what all of this has shown is it's a real shame that MSI or really any of Intel's other partners 
weren't able to offer a non-K overclocking board for under $200 US when the 12th gen series was first released. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. A big thank you to MSI's motherboard team for providing us with an early pre-production board to play around with. Again, very impressive stuff. I just wish you could buy it right now, but fingers crossed, it won't take too long for these boards to hit shelves. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like, subscribe for more content from Harbour Unboxed, and if you'd like to become a Harbour Unboxed community,